The cabinet meeting was hastily convened. Vice President Ford, for example, had to cancel a noon speech to attend, and rumors spread throughout the city that the president was preparing to resign. But when reporters and photographers were called in for a brief glimpse before the session started, President Nixon seemed in good spirits and all else appeared normal. Afterward, as an unusually large crowd of people gathered at the White House gates, reporters swarmed around emerging members of the cabinet, who said the president intends to stay on and wants them to do likewise. The foreign policy of the United States has always been conducted and will be, continue to be conducted on a bipartisan basis, in the national interest, and in the interest of world peace. And uh, this will be our attitude, and we will do it. The president expressed a firm resolve to not have this tragedy of Watergate obscure not only the accomplishments of the past, but our resolve in solving all the problems of the future. And that's what we cabinet members intend to do, just to continue to work on the problems that face our country. Everybody's staying on. We've got a lot of work to do. Did he say, did he say he that he's going through a Senate trial? He's going to go through the constitutional process. Did he expect that calls, that that calls for a Senate trial? I assume that's what he will do. Did he that's say that he expect to win in the Senate? He is going to see what happens when our time comes. I assume he's going in hoping that he's going to come out all right. Yes. Did he concede the possibility that he might be convicted in the Senate? Did no, he, he did not. No, he did not. Privately, however, one cabinet member was overheard declaring the jig's up. And others in the official family indicated they feel that it's no longer a question of if, but when the president departs. Presidential spokesman Gerald Warren confirmed that Sunday at Camp David, President Nixon had discussed the option of resignation with some of his aides. And Warren himself would no longer categorically rule resignation out. Robert Pierpoint, CBS News, at the White House. Slating the stock market, August 6th, take two. Stock market analysts say the market opened sharply higher because investors were anticipating the president's imminent resignation. During the first half hour of trading, the Dow Jones Industrial Average had soared more than 25 points. But when the emergency cabinet meeting at the White House ended and word reached the trading floor that the president would not resign, there was immediate heavy selling, and the 25-point gain was cut in half. One Wall Street analyst explained the movement this way. Psychologically, uh, the possibility of resignation, of an early resolution to the Watergate uh, question, would remove a significant weight overhanging the market. Fundamentally, it would allow Congress to go back to the legislative business at hand, uh, perhaps even including discussion of what to do about inflation. Stock market analysts point out that the Dow Jones Industrial Average has declined about 300 points during the past 19 months of the Nixon administration, and that investors would be happy to see a new face in the White House. Gary Shepard, CBS News, New York.
I am prepared to conclude that the magnificent public career of Richard Nixon must be terminated involuntarily. It was an agonizing decision for the congressman, the once the chief defender of the president on the Judiciary Sorry. Committee. And as the news came out of Washington last night, there was shock here in this conservative Republican stronghold, where the congressman is certain of re-election. The house where President Nixon was born is in Congressman Wiggins' district, and here in this neighborhood, as elsewhere in Orange County, you get the feeling that the strong support for the president is fading. At Joe's barber shop, most everyone was talking about Wiggins, Nixon, and impeachment today. The random, non-scientific sampling we took indicates many Republicans agree with their congressman. I, I think he did a masterly job of defending him in the Judiciary Committee, and uh, uh, I don't see any other course he can take now. What are your own political views uh, over the years? Well, uh, I've been a Republican uh, and voted the Republican ticket for ever since I've been an adult. I think the man should resign and that we should get with it as far as the government is concerned. Uh, we've been standing still. Do you think the president should resign? No, I don't think so. I do not think so. How do you feel about the congressman, Congressman Wiggins, changing his views right now? Well, I feel that he should have uh, waited a little longer, weighed the whole situation. At the congressman's home office headquarters today, the calls were running better than two to one, supporting Wiggins' demand that the president resign. Wiggins said it was with great reluctance and deep personal sorrow that he split with the president. And in this district, which Richard Nixon himself once represented as a young congressman, it appears that that reluctance, that sorrow, are shared by a growing number of Republican faithful. Terry Drinkwater, CBS News, Yorba Linda, California. While Democrats largely maintained a discreet silence, Republicans voiced their agony to newsmen and to each other. After they met behind closed doors for lunch, John Tower of Texas emerged to say that in his opinion, a majority of Republican senators feel the president should resign in the national interest. Well, their view is that it would be best for the country, regardless of the outcome of an impeachment trial. Uh, they feel that it would be a wrenching experience that perhaps would, uh, would uh, produce a leadership gap, uh, a weakened president, and uh, that the country is better served by, by resignation. That's their rationale. Tower says the Republicans feel the president still does not understand the hazards of a Senate trial, and they'll try to get word to him after a cooling off period of two or three days. Senate Republican leader Hugh Scott missed the meeting, and he declined to give his own feelings. My opinion is, uh, has been that as a member of the leadership, I should not uh, embarrass any of them without prior consultation. And soft-spoken George Aiken, dean of the entire Senate, spoke for a number of his Republican colleagues when he refused to issue a direct call for the president's resignation. I'm not his advisor. In fact, I can't recall having been asked for advice on any of this matter. But if he should resign, it would, of course, bring a big sigh of relief up here on the hill. One final indicator of the rapid erosion of support for the president, Republican Howard Baker, who repeatedly asked witnesses at the Watergate hearings, what did the president know and when did he know it, expressed particular distress at yesterday's revelation of the early presidential use of the CIA, calling that a stunning disclosure. Said Baker, I know now some of the things the president knew, and he knew them a long time ago. George Herman, CBS News, Washington.
The blast came just after 8 a.m. as passengers thronged the international terminal. The bomb had been placed in a public pay locker, and when it detonated, it shattered window glass over a block-long area, shredded luggage, and left survivors staggering about in the smoke and dust. Firemen and police quickly cordoned off the area while investigators searched for evidence. Within two hours, telephone threats were received at other airlines. Police cleared those terminals, but specially trained dogs found no more bombs. 17 of the 38 injured were taken to nearby hospitals. We talked with John Wilder, whose daughter was injured. I looked and saw my daughter flying through the air into the uh, baggage counter on the south wall. She, her, her head went right through the open doors of the baggage counter, and uh, it knocked her out naturally. Daughter Linda is listed in good condition tonight. Surgeons worked to save five critically injured persons while investigators puzzled over the reason for the bombing. There was no warning and no apparent motive. Foster Davis, CBS News, Los Angeles. In Iowa's 6th Congressional District, the economy is agricultural. The farmers of the district and the people of Sioux City, its population center, have elected Republican Wiley Maine to Congress for four terms. But his margin has been slipping. In 1972, Richard Nixon had a 62% plurality here. Maine received only 52%. Maine's role as a member of the Judiciary Committee hasn't made things any easier. He stayed with the president all the way, but after Richard Nixon's admission of yesterday, Wiley Maine announced that he, too, would vote to impeach. In Sioux City today, some unscientific random samplings revealed little disagreement with Maine's change of heart. I think uh, he should have changed his mind some time ago. I think the way he handled his, uh, uh, his votes and the way he spoke to the, uh, on television, I think it will hurt his election chances. Up until yesterday, I kind of think he was right. Today, I think he's right, he's right now, too. From what facts I've gathered, uh, watching television and reading the newspapers and listening to uh, the congressmen themselves, that uh, that's the only vote he could have uh, could have made. Maine faces a close race this year, and Woodbury County Republican Chairman Manny Bacacus voiced the hope that voters would understand Maine's position. He has now learned that there is direct evidence and is willing to vote for impeachment. And I think that uh, this he's done in good conscience, and he was always uh, acting in good faith previously. Damaging as the new evidence may be to the president, it may very well prove a help to staunch presidential defenders like Congressman Wiley Maine, helping to shift the burden of unpopular decision in an election year. Bill Plant, CBS News, Sioux City, Iowa. The stock market is now marching to the tune of the impeachment process, and the averages are rising and falling with each fact or rumor that reaches the trading floor. During the first half hour yesterday, speculation that the president's resignation was imminent sent the Dow Jones Industrial Average up nearly 26 points. But later, when it was revealed the president told his cabinet he would not leave office voluntarily, the market sold off. Stock market analysts offer a number of explanations for why the market is acting the way it is. Market seems to be saying that Mr. Nixon may very well step down either today or in the next few days. And the market would seems to be viewing this as a positive event. Well, so why should it go up in the first place then? It will go up again because 
while it's true we have inflation and it is true that we have high interest rates, it's also true that we've had a problem in terms of leadership in the U.S. and with Mr. Nixon resigning, one of those problems is out of the way. Uh, so at least we're, we have a start, if you will, and the market anticipates that kind of thinking. I think that uh, one of the things that had been bothering investors was the fear that the impeachment process might drag on out uh, until Congress reconvened in January. And the news of the last uh, 24 hours certainly suggests that we'll get a much earlier resolution uh, to Watergate than next January. Nobody can predict what the stock market will do during the next few days, but market analysts point out that the greatest single influence will be Richard Nixon himself. If he stays in office, they say, that will mean the market will go down, and if he leaves office, that, say the analysts, will produce a major stock market rally. Gary Shepard, CBS News, New York. Right. I believe it is absolutely imperative that he go before the Congress immediately and make a full disclosure of all the information he has on this matter, answering any and all questions the members may have. The constitutional process should then go forward in order to bring about a speedy resolution of this issue. The American people are entitled to this as well as to the whole truth once and for all. Made it clear, I think, before. Veteran Denver Bronco players have been hearing from Coach Johnny Ralston. Please come to camp. The Broncos got drubbed by the New York Jets 41-19 Saturday night, but not a single Bronco has reported. Elsewhere in the league, some three to 400 veterans, each for his own reason, have checked in. Of 54 players in the Jets camp, 39 are rookies or free agents. Coach Charlie Winner and General Manager Weeb Yobank want their experienced players in, but it seems the longer the strike continues, the greater number of them are going to be looking for another line of work. These are the boys that I feel most sorry for because uh, some of these boys really need the technique and fundamental work and not being here, they've let other people get their foot in the door and I just have a feeling that a lot of boys are not going to make the team that were on it last year. You've got ten rooks out here right now who look like they could make this club? we got a good number of them. I don't know whether we have ten or not, but we have a good number of them that I definitely feel will make the ball club. And they have lost a lot of valuable time now, especially some of the borderline people. I just don't understand some of their thinking because uh, uh, they, they, some of them have really lost jobs already. So you, you would think then that some of these kids are going to push some vets out of a job? There's no question about it. There's no question about it. They... When the strike is over, as it inevitably must be, what about bitterness? Strikers talk about it, rookies worry about it, and Charlie Winter discounts it. I think this has been vastly overplayed by uh, the leaders and the Players Association in an attempt to uh, more or less harass the players to stay out. I think they've used this uh, dissension tool. I've asked at least 15 of our veteran ball players the question that uh, if you're the last man to come in and John so-and-so is here all the time, when you come in, are you going to hold any resentment towards that individual? And in every case, the answer was no.
the really bad droughts were separated by one year. It tended to be two years apart. That's a characteristic of severe droughts in the U.S. incidentally that there's usually a one better year in between the two worst ones. So I hope that doesn't mean we don't have another in 1976. Well, do you have a feeling about that on the basis of the research you've done? Well, this alternation of years is called the quasi-biennial oscillation. It's rather widely recognized. It shows up in such things as drought frequency. So 76 would be the year to worry about more than 75. It may be just a dry year in the Midwest, but you have to take a wider view of it than that. You have to look at the whole world situation. It's the whole world that is cooling off. The North Atlantic Ocean has been cooling off since 1951. The frequency of droughts in the monsoon lands has been increasing. There are a lot of different things going on around the whole world. Now, just looking at these changes, you can say, well, it's gone this way, now it'll go back the other way, you know, bounce around, sometimes get warmer, sometimes colder. But if you study the history of past climates, you find that there was a time of rapid cooling of the Earth, about 1200 A.D., and then it sort of leveled off for a few hundred years. Another rapid cooling of the climate, about 1550 to 1600 A.D. And then the Earth stayed cold from 1600 A.D. to about the turn of this century. Then the temperature started going up and reached a peak about 1945. Then it started going down. And now we're back down to a temperature similar to around the turn of the century. If this is going to be normal, we've got problems. What kind of problems? Well, for example, between 1200 A.D. and 1400 A.D., the kind of drought that we have this year, the same pattern of drought in the Corn Belt, Nebraska, the Dakotas, eastern Colorado, western Texas, that pattern of drought lasted for the whole 200 years. Well, I hope that isn't the kind of normal that we are getting back to, because that would totally destroy the economy.
Residents of the integrated, heavily Democratic Detroit suburb displayed few public signs of interest over the special addition to the primary ballot. The question, should President Nixon be impeached? Last April, the Inkster City Council voted 6-1 to one in favor of placing the proposition before voters. The lone dissenter, Republican Mayor Edward Bivens. Long and ardent Nixon supporter, Bivens called the move a waste of time and money. My position is not based on my party affiliation because I do believe in calling uh, the shots as they are. If a person is wrong, and folks, folks know me for this, I will, in my opinion, I will indicate that they're wrong in my opinion. And in this instance, I say that if the president is guilty of these things, he will have his day in court or he will resign prior to that. And we should permit due process to take a hand in this case. That we should not go and, and try to be so uh, presumptive in this issue uh, to, to do something that is foolhardy and, and wasteful. The proposition's author, Democratic City Councilman Terrell Lassane, says the vote reflects grassroots sentiment that is significant and should not be ignored. I don't think any time uh, the citizens express their views uh, should be considered a waste of time. Uh, this government is uh, built on the principle of uh, participatory democracy, and, and this is what we're trying to uh, provide. Opinions of voters we talk with varied, but most favored impeachment. The country's bad shape, baby. Very bad shape. You feel impeachment is the answer? Uh, maybe we give it to him, maybe forward him, do something better. I don't think it's fair that we've got Nixon up there now and we're blaming him for everything. This is what I think. Now, from reading and hearing about the impeachment, I think that the politicians and us and everybody is trying to put the blame on one man. I voted for impeachment. Why? Why? That guy's the biggest crook in the country. Most eligible voters stayed at home, but proponents say the outcome reflects the community's sentiment. The election results will be passed on to Michigan's congressional delegation. Randy Daniels, CBS News, Inkster, Michigan. In the Riverdale section of New York City, what's going on is an awful pity. Water pours down when it rains because somebody's stealing the copper drains. Copper drains and pipes and sheaves are the objects of assorted thieves. Copper scuppers no longer scup since the price of copper went way, way up. An unlikely loot on which to settle, but copper now is a precious metal. Copper thieves aren't capture proof, but they're hard to see when they're on the roof. And if you'll excuse a slight monotony, it's an awful drain on the town's economy. And WCBS-TV has another item for us to see. Murray Throlford's a city cop who drew the duty to try and stop attacks from any extremist group on the visiting Soviet dancing troupe. One Moiseyev dancer chanced to remark that he'd like to venture to Central Park. But a fear inside him gently tugged that in Central Park he might be mugged. So, Officer Throlford led the way to the park so the dancers there could play. And they threw the frisbee with great delight and asked the officer, if he might, like to learn a step or two of the dances the Russian dancers do. 
That is how, on a summer day, policemen happen to act this way. A do si do with a Russian beauty, strictly, of course, in the line of duty. From New York State across the lake to Toronto, just for discussion's sake, is only 26 miles or so, but a whole lot longer by land to go. So now for the first time there, they've seen a boat that they call a hover marine. Not a hover craft or a hydrofoil, its engine runs on diesel oil. In 55 minutes it gets you there on a cushion of manufactured air. 40 miles an hour she goes, and as any sailor surely knows, whatever kind of boat you've got, you won't move much faster than 40 knots. $12 the price of a round trip ride, with 60 passengers there inside. An unusual sight for us to see through the eyes of WHEC. We've one more story yet to tell of Oliver Elliot and his bell. Elliot thinks that bells are fun, so he's collected more than one. He has bells that clang and bells that peal, bells that jingle or ring for meals, great big bells with a knell so grand, and little bells that you ring by hand. He likes to buy, but he will not sell, not so much as a single bell. In talking to Pittsburgh's KDKA, Oliver Elliott was heard to say, to get more bells is what he's craving for his house and grounds, which he calls Bell Haven. Charles Osgood, CBS News. If anyone shows up in Geneva tomorrow and the Turks claim, as they've been claiming, that they're respecting the ceasefire, it's not true. From their positions high in the Karenia mountain range, they began shelling Greek coastal positions at 10 o'clock this morning. It was a continuation of yesterday's fighting, but today the Turks were hitting villages a lot further from the ceasefire line. This was never even disputed territory. It's been in Greek hands since the very beginning. The Greek Cypriot National Guardsmen had nothing but small arms to fight back with, so they didn't even try. As the artillery crept closer, they took shelter behind an abandoned restaurant, hitting the ground when the shells started landing some 30 yards away. Meanwhile, other Greeks were coming towards us, abandoning positions they'd held in the foothills. The retreat was disorganized, chaotic. A commandeered truck didn't even have time to turn around. The Greeks, for the first time, left even the beaches unmanned. Ambulances couldn't get through to pick up the wounded. Shell-shocked soldiers were taken out on foot. Later, on the other side of the mountains, United Nations troops sat by helplessly as the Turks turned their guns on Greek villages which civilians had returned to after the ceasefire. 
they didn't hang around very long. The village of Condominos is now completely devoid of life. We have seen no activity there for the past one zero minutes. Over. At least the UN can report on these ceasefire violations, but back on the coast where the heaviest fighting was going on, the United Nations was nowhere to be seen. Bob Simon, CBS News, Cyprus. This is the arts yes. and slating. This is the arts and crafts Olympics with Charlie Kuralt, edited by Thomas Miklas. Take one. <laughs> This is a parade of Olympic champions, and there's not a shot putter or a 100-meter dash man in the crowd. You may find it a little hard to believe what all this uproar is about. It is about bricklaying and hairdressing and refrigerator repairing, occupations it is safe to say most of us, even bricklayers, hairdressers, and refrigerator repairmen, find fairly unexciting. But there is no accounting for the enthusiasms of youth. These are the Skill Olympics. 1,500 youngsters, most of them high school kids from all over the country, competing for gold, silver, and bronze medallions in things like bricklaying and 29 other skills and crafts. There is Doug Birdsong from Missouri building a brick wall as if there were no tomorrow. And if you don't think the competition is tough, notice that one youngster, a state champion, has already surrendered to a bad case of nerves and has given up. These are the kids, like Richard Halsell of Texas, who take carpentry in school, or electronics, or diesel mechanics. There are a couple of million kids like these, most of whom will never go to college, and on the theory that it takes more than college graduates to make a country, the vocational industrial clubs of America bring the most skillful together each year to fight it out in one day under one roof. It is a sight to remember, teenaged offset printers stripping negatives at a light table, while teenage nurses' aides help patients into bed and under the scrutiny of unsmiling judges, do their best to make their charges comfortable while trying to appear comfortable themselves. And in another corner, cosmetologists under the gun, battling each other in the clock with curlers and hairspray. That's Lloyd Smith, 19, of Cincinnati, Ohio. He'll be Mr. Lloyd someday. That is the Pennsylvania delegation just going out of its mind. Over what? over the news that Kenneth Fye of Pennsylvania won first place in high school machine drafting. I've been trying to think back. I guess it hasn't been since 1964, when Barry Goldwater won the Republican nomination, that I've seen such enthusiasm on the floor of a convention. And what do you know? There's old Doug Birdsong from Missouri, second place in high school bricklaying.
And look who's number one in cosmetology. Mr. Lloyd, 19 years old. And finally, they announced the prize for best vocational industrial club in the whole country. And when Chickasha High School from Chickasha, Oklahoma won it all, Sue Picorni just couldn't stand it. Just couldn't stand it. It was pretty clear that excellence in carpentry and auto mechanics and sheet metal working just means a lot more to these youngsters than it ever did before. That's good for them, I suppose. Good for us, too. Charles Kuralt, CBS News, on the road in San Antonio, Texas. As long as Richard Nixon is president, he's immune from prosecution for Watergate-related crimes. So it seemed unlikely that he would resign without first obtaining immunity from prosecution. This could come in any of four ways. First, Congress could pass a law granting him immunity. But events seem to be moving too fast, and many congressmen believe the law would be an unconstitutional intrusion by Congress into the authority of the judiciary. Second, Special Prosecutor Leon Jaworski could ask a court to grant immunity in exchange for Mr. Nixon's promise to testify. There have been no reports that this has been considered. Third, President Nixon could pardon himself. This has never been done, and nobody has said Mr. Nixon is considering doing it, but an 1866 Supreme Court decision said the president's power to pardon is unlimited, except from impeachments. And fourth, and apparently most likely, Gerald Ford could become president and grant Richard Nixon a blanket pardon in advance against any Watergate prosecution. But Ford would probably not act without the approval of congressional leaders because he's expressed disapproval of such deals. If a president resigned his office before his term expired, would his successor have the power to prevent or terminate any investigation or prosecution of criminal charges against the former president? Would he have the authority? Yes, would he have the power? I don't think the public would stand for it. But even if Mr. Nixon was to get immunity in any of these ways, several legal problems would remain. He could be subpoenaed to testify in all Watergate-related cases. He could still be indicted by state or local prosecutors for any Watergate crimes committed in their jurisdictions, although this would probably not happen. He could be sued in civil cases by victims of wiretapping or other illegal governmental acts, and he could be disbarred from the practice of law. So even if President Nixon should leave the White House with full federal immunity, he could be tied up in unpleasant and perhaps humiliating court proceedings for years to come. Fred Graham, CBS News, Washington.
This is the arts yes. and slating. This is the arts and crafts Olympics with Charlie Kuralt, edited by Thomas Miklas. Take one. <laughs> This is a parade of Olympic champions, and there's not a shot putter or a 100-meter dash man in the crowd. You may find it a little hard to believe what all this uproar is about. It is about bricklaying and hairdressing and refrigerator repairing, occupations it is safe to say most of us, even bricklayers, hairdressers, and refrigerator repairmen, find fairly unexciting. But there is no accounting for the enthusiasms of youth. These are the Skill Olympics. 1,500 youngsters, most of them high school kids from all over the country, competing for gold, silver, and bronze medallions in things like bricklaying and 29 other skills and crafts. There is Doug Birdsong from Missouri building a brick wall as if there were no tomorrow. And if you don't think the competition is tough, notice that one youngster, a state champion, has already surrendered to a bad case of nerves and has given up. These are the kids, like Richard Halsell of Texas, who take carpentry in school, or electronics, or diesel mechanics. There are a couple of million kids like these, most of whom will never go to college, and on the theory that it takes more than college graduates to make a country, the vocational industrial clubs of America bring the most skillful together each year to fight it out in one day under one roof. It is a sight to remember, teenaged offset printers stripping negatives at a light table, while teenage nurses' aides help patients into bed and under the scrutiny of unsmiling judges do their best to make their charges comfortable while trying to appear comfortable themselves. And in another corner, cosmetologists under the gun, battling each other in the clock with curlers and hairspray. That's Lloyd Smith, 19, of Cincinnati, Ohio. He'll be Mr. Lloyd someday. That is the Pennsylvania delegation just going out of its mind. Over what? over the news that Kenneth Fye of Pennsylvania won first place in high school machine drafting. I've been trying to think back. I guess it hasn't been since 1964, when Barry Goldwater won the Republican nomination, that I've seen such enthusiasm on the floor of a convention. And what do you know? There's old Doug Birdsong from Missouri, second place in high school bricklaying. And look who's number one in cosmetology. Mr. Lloyd, 19 years old. And finally, they announced the prize for best vocational industrial club in the whole country. And when Chickasha High School from Chickasha, Oklahoma won it all, Sue Picorni just couldn't stand it. Just couldn't stand it. It was pretty clear that excellence in carpentry and auto mechanics and sheet metal working just means a lot more to these youngsters than it ever did before. That's good for them, I suppose. Good for us, too. Charles Kuralt, CBS News, on the road in San Antonio, Texas. The tape machine that's recording us, the tape machine that's recording me now, you have your keys stuck. Can you open it, close it, please? Thank, thank you. Okay, slating. 
Uh, this is the non-edit tech, the non-composite piece of the t tight rope artist with Kelly, produced by Roger Sims. Take one. That somebody was Philippe Petit, a 24-year-old Frenchman, doing his higher wire act 1,350 feet up and no net below. He and some associates managed to hide out in the World Trade Center towers overnight, and early this morning rigged a 140-foot steel cable between the two buildings using some sort of crossbow device. Petit enthralled hundreds of people below, prancing about for more than an hour. But police in the audience decided Petit was better off in a police station, handcuffed securely to a chair. Why did you do this? Oh, that's the thousand uh, why in this morning. There is no why. Just uh, because uh, um, when, when I see a beautiful place to put my why, I cannot resist. Sergeant Charles Daniels, who talked Petit off the high wire, called it a first-rate performance. He was bouncing up and down. His feet were actually leaving the wire, and then he would resettle back on the wire again. And then he would go down on one knee, and he'd balance the, uh, his uh, hand pole and lay down on his back and put his hands behind his neck and just completely relax and swing one of his legs over the wire in a carefree uh, manner. Was he laughing and smiling? Well, not when he would do that. He would just lay there and relax as if he wanted to just take a little nap. As spectacular sights go, how would you rate this one? Supreme. The apex of excitement. Petit was charged with disorderly conduct and criminal trespass and received a quick sentence, doing a free show for children in Central Park. Chris Kelly, CBS News, New York. As police began sifting through three truckloads of debris from the locker area where the bomb went off, an anonymous phone call came in, a man with a heavy accent calling a Los Angeles newspaper to claim responsibility for the bombing. He spoke knowledgeably about the bomb's construction and its location, but offered no motive. Police don't know if the call was legitimate. Investigators are examining this film, taken by a Japanese tourist seconds after the bomb went off. The Pan Am terminal filled with smoke, dead and injured scattered amid broken glass and twisted metal. The two men who died were both airport skycaps. Some of the 36 injured still hospitalized, among them airport security guard Vincent Bush. I was blown across the room, maybe 10 or 15 feet. I, I think probably what struck me the most was the, the magnitude of the, whatever it was just tore everything apart just ripped everything to pieces. 
I heard, I heard in the news last night that the blast was felt like 20, 20 miles away. And I was within 35 feet. <laughs> it's just amazing. I guess it just wasn't my time to go. Authorities now say there was no way the blast could have been prevented. Security procedures have now been tightened, more guards have been laid on, and baggage lockers are being moved behind security checkpoints so that anything placed in a locker must be inspected first. Foster Davis, CBS News, Los Angeles. I now have completed that last uh, gap uh, that I said I would do. If the evidence were available, it is available. So I'm prepared to vote to impeach. I think we need some new blood, Democrats and Republicans. Yesterday, Sandman's re-election opponent, William Hughes, was out telling voters in a Pleasantville, New Jersey shopping center that the Sandman change of heart was another, quote, flip-flop for political expediency. When he found that Mr. Nixon was an anchor around his neck why he cast the anchor off and of course he utilized the release of those additional tapes as a reason well, now that may have been clearly one of the reasons because he put all his apples in one basket and when that basket was taken away from him uh, by the additional evidence which was a, of the same type basically as the previous evidence uh, then he had nowhere to go except to reject mr nixon some 40 miles to the south of Pleasantville is the seacoast town of Cape May, considered by many the Sandman stronghold. Last weekend, a CBS News at random poll found that most voters interviewed believe Sandman's staunch defense of the president last week was honest. But since their congressman's change of heart Tuesday, voters' feelings appear to be mixed. How do you feel about him changing his mind? I think he did the right thing. I approve very much of his action. And I'm very happy about it. Now he's looking out for his own skin. I really think that uh, uh, everything he did was uh, for political reasons, and I think he uh, will lose out on account of that. Uh, that's what we expected of Charlie. That's what we continue to expect from him. And again, as I say, as an attorney of some renown, he argued the law. His opponent says he's just playing politics. Well, uh, that's a normal thing for an opponent to say. I would be very much surprised if he said anything else. It is difficult to say whether Sandman's support is melting in Cape May or whether it remains as strong as it's always been in the past. Watergate has not helped, and like most every other Republican incumbent, the times are critical for Sandman in trying to keep his political future afloat. Bob McNamara, CBS News, Cape May, New Jersey. The Tanglewood Golf Club is the scene for this week's PGA, the first of the Grand Slam major events to come to North Carolina since 1936. Heading the entries are Gary Player, defending champion Jack Nicklaus, and ever-popular Arnold Palmer. But the star of the show may be the toughened up but unheralded Tanglewood course, a Trent Jones layout was, that was criticized by some for its obscurity. But it's prime for this major championship. The number of bunkers were doubled by designer Jones. New tees have lengthened this once meek test to a 7,000-yard tiger. And the real problem is the 5-inch Bermuda rough. Recent rains have left it so deep and thick, some are saying it's unfair. As for the players, Nicholas isn't too excited. Um, I haven't, uh, I just haven't particularly, you know, well, following, following last year, I won, you know, three or four more tournaments after winning the PGA last year. So if my drive was going to fall off, it was falling off then. Right now, my game is falling off, so. Um, In what way? Well, I just, well, I haven't won since Hawaii, and I haven't particularly played that well. South Africa's player rates an edge over Nicholas with two of the three majors in hand, the Masters and the British Open. Player tries to equal Ben Hogan's feat of winning three of the four in one year. 
Well, uh, Jim, uh, it would certainly be a great thrill to be able to win uh, three major championships in one year. It's a tall order, but it's possible, and uh, you know, you've got to be putting very well and hold the putts at the right time. That makes the big difference. I must say I uh, like the layout of the golf course very much, and I think it's going to be a good championship. I think the scoring is going to be uh, better than the players think it is. The young Lions will put up a stiff argument. Players like Jerry Hurd or the year's leading money winner, Johnny Miller, are typical of the other strong challengers in this field. This is Jim Thacker, Clemens, North Carolina. Here on the Mississippi Gulf Coast, where fishing is a major industry, Richard Nixon has always had his strongest die-hard support. But now that has changed. The Mississippi Republican National Committeeman, Victor Marvar, himself a fisherman, believes there is little else for the president to do but resign. I think, uh, first of all, it's important that every shred of evidence be released. And uh, if it has the same tone as the evidence which was released in the last couple of days, I think uh, resignation should come quickly. How deep does your disappointment run? Very deep. But among the men and women on the streets and wharves of Biloxi, the verdict is not unanimous. Do the other shrimpers feel the way that you do? I think most of them does. Have you talked about it some? We have every time the uh, radio come on the news uh, is uh, Watergate, Nixon, Watergate, Nixon. The boys all say that he should go ahead and resign, and that's it. Do you think President Nixon should resign? No, sir, I don't. Why not? I truly really don't. I, I really believe in him. That's all. It's just one of them things. Uh, it's, he may have done wrong, but I don't think it should amount to that much. A lot of them's done a lot worse. I mean, you know, in in the political field. So I really don't feel that bad about it. Do you think that President Nixon should resign? Uh, I think he should. Why do you think so? Because he told falsehoods to, to, to the United States public. He lied to them. Now, I think he, uh, if he don't resign, they're going to impeach him now. Are you disappointed in what has happened? Yes, there's some trust that you put in a man that you kind of get disillusioned when stuff like this comes out. In 1972, Richard Nixon received his greatest percentage of the vote in Mississippi, 78%. But now, even that is blowing away. David Dick, CBS News, Biloxi, Mississippi. British are disappointed that President Nixon has not resigned. That is the overwhelming message from the media, the politicians, and the man in the street. The loud British demands that President Nixon should resign are not only a comparatively recent phenomenon, but uncharacteristic for a people who do not usually try to intervene in other countries' domestic affairs. But the British, and one suspects many other Europeans, have concluded that President Nixon is not only an American problem, he has become a world problem. They see the United States as now leaderless, ad-libbing its way not only through foreign policy, but even more importantly, through economic policy. British officials complain the United States doesn't have a real economic policy anymore because of the absence of presidential leadership. They say the necessary cooperation and coordination with Washington just isn't happening during the Watergate crisis. The British, desperately mired in their own economic problems, think that indecision in the policies of the world's greatest financial and industrial power can only make their own plight worse. That's one of the major reasons they've come to the conclusion that President Nixon is now an international liability. Charles Collingwood, 
CBS News, London. As Assistant Secretary of State Hartman was talking with Foreign Minister Mavros, the Greek newspapers, which are no longer censored, were headlining a rising tide of anti-Americanism here. This one, how the Americans cheated Greece. This one, the CIA is responsible for lighting the fire in Cyprus. Today, America's long-standing friendship with Greece appears in jeopardy largely according to the Greeks because the U.S. did not side with Greece when Turkey invaded Cyprus. U.S. installations here have received anonymous telephone calls warning that Americans could be shot in the streets. These Americans could presumably become the principal targets of anti-Americanism. The nearly 10,000 American servicemen and their families based in Greece. They've been told to keep to their bases and homes and they do. Their presence here reminds Greeks that America has powerful sea and air forces stationed in Greece. Premier Constantine Karamanlis is not an enemy of the United States, but one of his terms was that he would not submit to any strong arm pressure from the United States in determining the future of Greece. Another was that he would not brook any interference from the CIA in Greece's internal affairs. If he gets that, he may be able to restore what the Eastern Mediterranean does not have today, a solid flank of NATO based on the friendship of Greece, Turkey, and the United States. Dean Braylis, CBS News, Athens. Administration policy, particularly on the economic front, is now being made without President Nixon and even in defiance of him. For example, in his July 25th economic speech, Mr. Nixon urged consumers to spend less. A cut of only 1.5% in personal consumption expenditures, that would mean like putting away 15 cents for every $10 spent, would make a similar difference in the fight against inflation. But quickly, Sidney Jones, deputy to White House economic counselor Kenneth Rush, told a news conference that he hoped consumers wouldn't take that literally. He said, I don't want to see it. We don't want a consumer boycott. Another example, Mr. Nixon rejected both a tax increase and a tax cut or any new short-term measure. He said, If experience teaches anything, it is that economic policies aimed exclusively at short-term relief, too often bring long-term grief. We must learn to think less in terms of programs and more in terms of policies. But Treasury Secretary William Simon has indicated the administration may back a new emergency job creation program if unemployment goes much higher, paid for in part by some tax increase. A third example. Mr. Nixon announced that he wants to re-evaluate the trade-off between production and environmental controls. He said, Those goals are important. But we too often, recently, have had a tendency to push particular social goals so far and so fast that other important economic goals are unduly sacrificed. But 
Environmental Protection Administrator Russell Train says he does not agree that economic goals have been unduly sacrificed, and EPA is clearly not ready to permit the rollback of a decade of ecological legislation because the president thinks it hurts business. And finally, Mr. Nixon has been saying through Budget Director Roy Ash that it's time to rewrite antitrust legislation to permit more corporate mergers. Ash gave the president's view that 10 big companies may be more competitive as well as more efficient than 100 smaller companies. But Assistant Attorney General Thomas Cowper, in charge of the antitrust division, has told House Republicans that the Justice Department policy is vigorous enforcement of antitrust laws and big business will be a major target of the antitrust division. It is almost as though in terms of policy making, what Mr. Nixon says doesn't matter anymore. Daniel Shaw, CBS News, Washington.